About 200 years ago, a multitude of slaves all across France's largest Caribbean colony began to mobilize, beginning a 12-year-long conflict that would leave hundreds of thousands dead in an event that would later be known as the Haitian Revolution. In 1802, the French leader Napoleon Bonaparte sent a contingent of five to 6,000 troops from the recently allied Duchy of Warsaw to the island of Hispaniola in order to assist in putting down the rebellion. But this proved to be a bad idea as many of the Poles actually turned coat and joined the liberated slaves against the French. After the war, a large chunk of this contingent actually settled in the newly formed country of Haiti, especially the town of Kezao, derivative of the Polish surname Zaleski, and being one of the few European groups given rights by the Haitian constitution, their descendants, who are mostly mixed race, easily number in the tens of thousands in the country today, with many still acknowledging their paternal Polish ancestry. This is only one story out of hundreds that stand out as some of the strangest cases of small-scale migration that can lead to interesting ethnic enclaves for a group that's definitely a long way from home. I mean, the world is so incredibly mixed up, how are we supposed to keep up with this insanity? We might as well chop everyone up and send them all back, am I right? Oh wait, we already did that video. Well, today we're going to be discussing just how and why these ethnic enclaves have formed all around the globe, with some of them being rather unbelievable when you first hear of them. For instance, a lot of people know that the old city of Jerusalem is divided between historic quarters for Jews, Muslims, and Christians, but not many know that the 4th district was actually granted to ethnic Armenians, known even to this day as the Armenian Quarter. For literally thousands of years, Armenians were an important and prominent minority in Anatolia and the Levant, and it is known that the city of Jerusalem has had a significant Armenian population since at least 300 AD. Unlike the majority of Christians in the city, the Armenians of Jerusalem don't speak Arabic, nor do they have an Arab background. However, their community has been in decline for the past century, and the population of the Armenian quarter in the old city is only around 2,000 people. I've expressed in the past how the Caucasian region lying between Eastern Europe and Southwest Asia has one of the highest rates of diaspora for any region on the planet. And this is true for the Armenians, Azeris, Circassians, and also for one of the lesser known peoples of the Caucasus, the Ossetians, who are considered to be an Iranian people today by most linguists, although really Ossetians are the last remnants of the once powerful Scythian people. And they used to inhabit the bulk of the Northern Caucasus, parts of Eastern Europe, and all of Central Asia. When the Mongol Empire invaded their homeland in the 13th century, a large tribe of Ossetians fled to Europe, eventually settling in the Kingdom of Hungary, where they were granted land and became known as the Jassic or Jazz people. Over time, the Jassics picked up the Hungarian language and their original language went extinct, and officially the Jassics are considered to be ethnic Hungarians in the Hungarian census, and because of assimilation and intermarriage, there are probably no major genetic or cultural differences between self-identified Jassics and the average Hungarian population. But nevertheless, many in the Jassag region today have begun to identify with the Ossetian Scythian roots of their ancestors. Ironically, the Hungarians themselves are, to a certain extent, strangers in this continent as well, as the Magyar nation actually originated through the migration of Uralic North Asian tribes located in modern-day Russia. Over time, the gene pool for Hungarians was significantly mixed with the surrounding Slavic and Germanic peoples, which is why modern Hungarians are genetically European, yet speak a Uralic language. And interestingly, when the Ottoman Turks conquered much of the Balkans and a significant proportion of Hungary was absorbed by the Ottoman Empire, many Hungarian boys and men were conscripted for the empire's Janissary forces. When the Ottomans began their war against the Mamluks in Egypt, a large number of Hungarians and other Janissaries were deployed in Egypt with a great degree of success, and many of the Hungarians were allowed to settle along the Nile in Upper Egypt, and despite converting to Islam, speaking Arabic, and marrying into the native population of Egyptian Arabs and the dark-skinned Nubians, the descendants of these Hungarian troops still retain a distinct identity from their neighbors even to this day. Known as the Magyarab people of Egypt and Sudan, a subject I actually dedicated an entire video to. Another peculiar ethnic anomaly in Europe are the Gagauz people from Moldova and to a lesser extent Ukraine. They're notable for being one of the very few Turkic peoples who are not Islamic, actually practicing Eastern Orthodoxy, although no one is sure of the exact origin of the Gagauz. 
Some claim they are the descendants of Turkish-speaking Bulgarians, which would explain their strong genetic connection to said group, although some hypothesize that they are descended from Seljuk Turks who settled in the region and converted to Christianity. Either way, the Gagao's language and culture is very much alive and vibrant, and it doesn't appear that they will disappear anytime soon. Now, some interesting African diasporas that are seldom discussed are those that resulted from the slave trade conducted by the Ottoman Empire in the 18th and 19th century. The descendants of these Africans are scattered throughout the former empire, including Turkey, where Afro-Turks number up to 100,000 people, located mostly on the Aegean Sea coast, and are known to have fought in World War I and many other conflicts. There is also a much smaller African community in Abkhazia, where they were formerly centered around the town of Adzyabzya, as well as in the Montenegrin city of Olsinj, where they number a couple hundred, or about 2% of the city, not exactly an ethnic enclave, but incredibly surprising nonetheless. One of the African nations that has the smallest and least explored diaspora are the Malagasy of the island of Madagascar, who are already of great interest for their unique origin, being a mix of Austronesians and Bantus from Southeast Asia and Southeast Africa, respectively. However, it was known that there were some Americans of partial Malagasy ancestry, including Robert Reed Church of Tennessee, who would go on to become one of the wealthiest men in all of the South in the post-Civil War era. There actually is a Malagasy enclave in the Americas in the Peruvian city of Piura, where they lived in an area known as La Mangacheria, although as you probably could have guessed, they no longer speak the Malagasy language and identify more with other Afro-Peruvians. In fact, South America as a continent has many other demographic quirks, such as the Guyanas, which are populated mostly by Hindu and Muslim South Asians along the coast in major cities, with Amerindians and Maroons, who are descendants of escaped African slaves, populating much of the interior. But it gets even more wacky as there's actually a strong Southeast Asian presence through nearly 80,000 ethnic Javanese in Suriname who were transplanted there by the Dutch in the 19th century and a handful of villages in French Guyana populated by Hmong refugees who settled there in the 70s after fleeing the Vietnam War, with these villages being almost indistinguishable from any Hmong village in Laos or Vietnam. And speaking of Southeast Asia, it's possible many of you may have heard of the Kingdom of Champa, a rather modest kingdom that was located on the coast of Indochina, or modern southern Vietnam, bordering Dai Viet and the Khmer Empire, although chances are you didn't know that the Cham were actually Austronesians originating from the northern coast of the island of Sumatra, meaning they're actually closer to Filipinos, Malays, and Indonesians. Although the Champa Kingdom was later crushed by the expanding Vietnamese in the 19th century, many Cham refugees fled into the mountainous interior of Vietnam and Cambodia, where their descendants still live to this day. Ethnic Chams are actually incredibly unique for being some of the last remaining practitioners of Islam in Cambodia and of Hinduism in Vietnam, and they're surrounded by other closely related Austronesian peoples, even though they're encompassed by the Vietnamese, Khmer, and other Austro-Asiatic speakers. But back to South America, one of the most interesting cases of an immigrant group that has remained unassimilated in their new country over the generations are the English, Irish, Scottish, but especially the Welsh immigrants to the region of Patagonia and the countries of Argentina and Chile. Despite some Welsh families settling in the region as early as the late 1800s, the residents of Yewoladfa and other Welsh towns have retained their own culture over the years, although only a small minority, mostly the elderly, speak Patagonian Welsh, a distinct dialect of the Welsh language unique to the region. A stone's throw away from this lies the island of Tierra del Fuego and the city of Punta Arenas in Chile, which is unique for having the highest percentage of ethnic Croatians outside of the former Yugoslavia, with many Croats and Eastern Europeans being contracted during the Tierra del Fuego gold rush from 1883 to 1906. And both of these topics we've discussed in depth in past videos. Now I know it's really obvious that the United States is a patchwork of pretty much every single nation imaginable, but one topic I found particularly interesting was the migration patterns of early Finnish immigrants. There are around 650,000 self-identified Finnish Americans according to the United States Census Bureau, although by far the largest concentration is located around this area here, centered around Lake Superior. Due to the area's uncanny superficial resemblance to Finland through its climate and geology, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, along with northern Wisconsin and the Arrowhead region of Minnesota, received an amount of Finnish immigrants greatly out of proportion for its established population, and today around 30 to 40% of Americans in this region around Lake Superior have Finnish ancestry. 
Or in other words, this contains over one-fourth of all Finnish Americans, despite making up less than 1% of the country's population. And there are even many Finnish settlements across the border in neighboring Ontario and Manitoba. So to end, it would surprise many to learn that the largest Chinatown in Europe is actually in the middle of Italy. Indeed, the city of Prato in the region of Tuscany in central Italy has seen an unprecedented number of Chinese immigrants in the past couple decades, with some estimates placing the number of legal and illegal Chinese immigrants in the mid-sized city at almost 25% of the population, which is an insanely high percentage for European standards. I hope you all learned something new today. Go ahead and let me know which ethnic, religious, or linguistic enclave you find to be the most interesting, either from history or the modern age. And I hope you've seen just how many fascinating stories there are to tell, and why I will never run out of video topics. As always, thank you all for watching. This has been Mason, and I will see you next time.